And as we do every Wednesday, it seems like she comes on like Jim Les earlier. Every time she comes on, it's after a terrible loss. But she is uh, back after arriving early this morning on the team plane, and she is out and about doing uh, adult things. <laughs> the one, the only, the uh, analyst for your Sacramento Kings, Katie Lauren Christensen. Good morning. Good morning, fellas. I feel like I'm going to, I need to take a look at like the Kings win loss record on Tuesdays. And we're going to consider changing the day that I come on with you guys. <laughs> yeah, it probably ain't great, Katie. And uh, we, I, I didn't, I, I was like I've had some losses recently on Tuesdays. Well, I wasn't there last week. Uh, you know, the funny thing is they didn't play on a Tuesday until November 28th, and they won. Okay, so you're 1-0. Then the Clippers, <laughs> uh, Clippers, 1-1. One and one. Uh, oh. At Portland, 1-2. Oh. and two. Charlotte, 1-3. Oh. and three. At, at, <laughs> at Detroit, which they were, that was setting itself up for bad. Uh, so two and three, and then last night, uh, two and four. With three of the worst losses. Three of the worst losses of the year coming on a Tuesday. Katie, let's start it out simple, uh, because if there's one thing I know you love, it's me trying to nail you down on an answer. Was last night the worst loss of the year? It certainly feels like it. Yeah. I don't know if that's because it's the most recent. Um. But no, gosh, you know, like, I feel like the losses, I don't know, I guess you look at Milwaukee and that one hurts really bad because <clears throat> it came down to free throws. That was something you can totally control. Last night, you had a 22-point lead with like eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter. And then there was a, a stretch of possessions because I keep a chart while the game's going so that I can track things and whatever. Um there was a stretch where there were seven possessions and during those seven possessions, it went turnover, 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 block, block, basket, turnover, mm. <laughs> seven straight possessions. <laughs> you got one shot off in seven possessions and you turned it over four times and got your shot blocked twice. So, I mean, it was, I felt like when they, when they went to that small lineup and put Kevin Durant on, uh, DeMontis Sabonis, it completely stalled everything out. Um, and this is not a team that searches for match or mismatches and tries to take advantage of matchups in that way. Like they just run their stuff. They just, they get ball movement. They move, you know, get inside, get outside, move it around, get, you know, switch balls from side to side. And it felt like it just completely stalled out. And they were forcing things and they, they created turnovers. And it just, I, I, probably think for how much they completely dominated to then going to where they just completely imploded. Yeah. I, I would say it probably is the worst loss of the season in that way. Yeah. And it was so weird to see it firsthand. Obviously you were there Katie, but I, I mean, from stretches of maybe their most beautiful basketball of how they were uh, spreading the floor and passing and cutting and pace, pace, pace. I felt like, man, they were just crisp to just granted yeah everything you said phoenix went small and it tricked some things up but they just lost all of their pace all of their flow and mike brown said post game like we're gonna have to figure this out because other teams are now gonna you know attempt to do this i couldn't believe how much of the rhythm they lost by that did that surprise you yeah it surprised me i think the way that i looked at the game you guys is i felt like it was one of the best defensive performances that i had seen from this team um, for the first three quarters, right? You go back to Detroit, it was a terrible first quarter and then a great three quarters. And then it was a great four quarters in, in Charlotte. And, and Coach Brown actually said after that, he said, I think that's the best seven consecutive quarters of defense that I've seen from this team since I've been here. I felt like last night was their best defensive performance that I've seen under Coach Brown until the fourth quarter. And so to me, the, the reason that the offense started to look so bad is because their defense looks so bad. And what I've seen with this team recently is they're allowing 
their, it's like they need their offense to be clicking to get their defense to be clicking. Does that ring true to you guys? Do you mm-hmm. see what I'm saying? Yeah. Instead of the other way around. And that's why I felt <clears throat> that the way they started the game, they forced three turnovers so quickly within the first like three, four minutes of the game. And they got out and ran, they moved the ball. The pace was uh, great. And not just, you know, a lot of times people who talk pace, they think up and down pace. No, I'm talking, this team has the best pace in the half court of anyone in the NBA when they're playing their style of basketball. And they were just, they were just firing on all cylinders. And then they stalled out on the offensive side because of a change and an adjustment in the defense by Phoenix. And I felt like that completely just put a damper on, on the defensive side of the ball. Katie Christensen joining us. I, I, I th- you know, we've been trying to dissect this all morning. And a lot of this is just really philosophical and psychological, Katie, but it, it's not, this isn't like a new thing. I mean, last night was a new thing, but it, it, you know, when we talk about like, was this the worst loss of the year? We ran through the list, whether it was Charlotte at home, whether it was new Orleans at home by when they were down by 50 Milwaukee, a couple nights ago, the uh, Boston, where they didn't have Tatum or uh, Horford, uh, the, well, every time they play new Orleans, we went all the way back, Katie, November 1st, uh, when, they, when Clay Thompson at the 17 footer at the last second and, and golden state won, like, obviously there's a lot of different types of losses, but it just seems again, going back to Milwaukee, something there's this, this cold or flu or something of the brain that seems to happen late in games at times for this team. And how do you put your finger or can you put your finger? I don't even think Dave, that you can call it late in games. I mean, you can call it late in games because of the last two games. But our, the losses that the Kings have had this year are not like we've seen the last two games. The losses that the Kings have had this year, they either win or they're like by, you know, a, a decent, you know, margin or they lose by a, a massive margin. That's what it feels like to me. I don't have the schedule in front of me with the results and all the stuff. And, you know, and there's also, that's also sometimes deceptive to look at because, you know, you can put, uh, like one thing that stands out to me, I think it was game two on the road in Houston. Those are two games that the Kings just got blown out. Mike Brown put in, you know, like the third string and they probably, you know, had a 15 to something run, you know, so the end score is not what the game actually was. Um, and I, that to me, that's the, the most startling component of this team in 20, you know, three twenty four versus 22-23 is like De'Aaron Fox was the clutch player of the year last year. We've barely seen any clutch situations and we're at the midway point of the season. This team was in games last year and, and they were fantastic at finishing them because of the play of De'Aaron Fox. This year, there's been hardly any clutch situations, which is five points within the last five minutes of the game. Mm. It's not there. Yeah. Talk with Katie Christensen, TV analyst here on the Folsom Lake Honda hotline. Katie, from your playing days, can you speak to the value? Because we, we get a lot of this, whether it's texts or people in the chat or see it on social media. When when you lose games like this, people a lot of times go right to the leaders of the team. What? What's the value of that? Like, I mean, I think that's a blanket statement to grab and say that the leaders got to prevent this from happening. I know it's not as easy as that, but uh, is that something you think this team is is missing a piece of right there? It's really hard to say, Jason, because I'm not, I, none of us are. None of us are in that locker room and kind of know what the voices are and what they sound like. Um and so it's really hard to say. I mean, it's very possible that the leaders are speaking up, that they're vocal, and that it's just not its just not resonating or it's just not coming to fruition. Um, I mean, it's a very valid question. But I also, there's like a component of this to a certain degree where I think it happens in professional sports that we want to talk about leaders. Yes, leaders are really, really important. They are. 
but this is professional sports. We're not talking about high school. We're not talking about college. We're talking about professional sports where everybody should be held to a different level of accountability, whether or not you're quote unquote, the leader of the team or you're not, everyone is fully aware of their role and they're fully held accountable for whether they're executing their role or not. And so, you know, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I say, Oh gosh, you know, this is on the leaders. I, I really don't tend to do that. I mean, I look at this collective unit, this team, and every single one of them is responsible for having a voice. It's not two or three guys. Every single one of them is responsible for having a voice. Because when you look at this team, and one of the things that was special about them last year, you guys, they were the chemistry and the relationships on this team were better than any team I've ever seen that I've covered. And so to me, it's like whether or not it's Domas or De'Aaron or Harrison, Speaking up, that's the dynamics of this team. Everybody has a voice and everyone is going to be respected and listened to. So, I mean, I, I get the question and I understand. I just, I don't know. I don't know if, if, if I think that that is as relevant in pro sports as it is at other levels. Well, where's that voice post game after bad losses? Are you talking about coming out in front of the media? Yeah, I'm saying this has happened a few times. Uh, you know, yeah, Keon Ellis going up twice last night. Uh, a bunch of people didn't talk. And Katie, you know I'm not indifferent to emotional, tough loss every once in a while. They've all done it. LeBron, Michael Jordan, every player ever has not talked to the media uh, on, on occasions. But that also seems kind of a, a thing here as well. So if you, you got a voice, where's that voice after the bad losses? Yeah, again, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I can think of uh, three seasons ago where I felt like Harrison Barnes was hung out to dry in front of the podium, like yeah. time after time after time. Like, I know what you're saying. Um, to be honest, Dave, I don't know sure. if it's like an avoidance or if it's like, okay, we're on uh, the last game of, you know, we're on a road trip. You get on a plane right after, you know, you fly to the next destination, whether last night it was home or, you know, whether it's another city. And, like, I know how it works when you're there. It's like, okay, you get a text. It's like the bus, the first bus is at 10, second bus is 10, 15. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of the leaders, if you want, the quote-unquote leaders, which are the guys that play big minutes, I think that they're immediately going and getting on a training table. Like, because they have very little time before when you have to shower, get on the bus and the game ends. And so I think I'm assuming, I don't know for a fact, I have a feeling on the road that it's more of a logistics thing and they're getting on a training table and they're getting the ice and stem there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I honestly, I don't know. Okay. But I, I, I think it is a valid question. Mm -hmm. You know, Katie, I think one of the interesting things about this year to last year, where I'd say probably at least 80% of the team is the same, coaching staff the same, and there's something to be said about continuity, and the Kings kind of hung their hat on that last year at the trade deadline when everybody else kind of moved. The Kings stuck with it, and it ended up paying off dividends, and they ended up with the three seed. I find this year so strange in that technically they've got a better record than they did a year ago, though we just discussed – all these head scratching, puzzling losses with with roughly the same team that's intact from a year ago. Have you seen enough? Do you think this what we've seen with this inconsistency is going to ignite some sort of necessary move for Monty McNair, Wes Wilcox, in that front office? If I had to guess and put you know my eggs in that basket, um, one thing that I feel like I understand about this front office and this coaching staff just based on all of the times that I've been in front of front of these people as they're being asked questions. My gut tells me that they feel that it is important to stick with core and chemistry that has been developed into further development. And I I completely understand the question of like, oh, because of these losses, because of, you know, the things that we've seen this year, we must make change. We must make change, make change, make change, make change. Got to improve, got to improve. You always want to improve. But 
I think that Wes Wilcox and Monty McNair have showed us something in their time running this front office is that they're willing to make moves, but they're also willing to not make moves that don't work for the sake of making moves. Is that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, no, for sure. Like if I think if there's a move to be made that they feel makes this team better, they make it. They're not going to make a move because of a knee jerk reaction to some bad losses. Katie Christensen with us. You know, we talked to Jim last former Sacramento King and UC Davis head coach earlier. And all I asked him from a coaching perspective. I'm going to ask you from a player perspective is last night, as you know, they, they Frank Vogel put Kevin Durant at center. Uh, they went small, surrounded him with shooters and the Kings had absolutely no answer for that whatsoever. In your experience as a player, whatever situations where you're out there and you're looking within, you're looking at the coaching staff, and you have this epiphany at some point that nobody has any idea what to do <laughs> in, the, in the moment. No, I've never felt that way. Didn't, no. it see, didn't it see? I mean, am I wrong that it seemed like last night the coaches and players got absolutely pantsed by that move and had no idea how to counter it? No, I don't think the coaches got pounced by it. I, I think that the players did because I'm sitting there right in front of, you know, the, the I'm five feet away from where Mike Brown is walking by and yelling at his team because offensively they were on the other end in front of the, the Suns bench. And he's saying the same thing that he always says move the ball, run your, like, do not stop and stall because they changed the matchup. It's the same freaking thing with, I hear him countless times repeatedly saying when a team goes to a zone defense, play your player to player offense against it. It's the thing you just adjust screens. You just, you, you dive to different areas. Like your principles don't freaking change. So, no, I completely disagree that the coaching staff got pants by this. The players did not execute. They, it was like a deer in headlights. They got stunned. That should only happen once, right? It, it, so well, the, me, ne the, 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 the yeah, next time it happens, uh -huh. the next time it happens, they've been there, they've done that. Okay, go to a small lineup. We're still going to run our stuff. We're not going to try and ISO. Domas on the low block against uh, freaking Kevin Durant, who, like, I think it's shocking that we even, you know, call that going small. Yeah. He's not freaking small. He's bigger than Demo DeMontis. He's, he's, he's bigger than, yeah, he's bigger than Domas. So, anyway, I mean, I, no, I emphatically disagree with that. Okay, and so, and, like, I'm not arguing with you here, just to be clear. I, I just want to talk it out. So I, no, I'm not. I, I'm not. You know I would. <laughs> So we're friends. I know how you work. Uh, I'm really questioning whether or not this is an argument. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, you, you know, I'm just saying to your point, then if it, if it's the players didn't execute and it's not on the coaches, then I guess my last question on that would be, isn't it incumbent on the coaches then to rotate out and put players in that are executing or at least remove the players that aren't at least one or two of them. Okay. Really great question, Thank except you. for you know the freaking answer. <laughs> if they take out those players that are the best finishing lineup that they have and lose the game, Mike Brown's an idiot. Why did he take them out? Those are the guys you trust. Those are the guys that are in those situations. That's the lineup you put out there that you trust to execute. They didn't execute. Listen, I'm not okay with how the how that loss came about, but I'm also not going to sit here and be like, "This is on Mike Brown," or that you know. Listen, it's on everybody, but Mike Brown is fighting a losing battle because if he freaking takes them out, and you know it, Dave, you know it. You've been on Twitter or X or whatever the hell they call it now. You've been on all the message boards. You listen to your callers. You you freaking know if he takes them out because they're not quote unquote executing and they lose. It's because he took them out. He doesn't take them out and they lose. Why don't you make a change? Right. But I'm not it's equating the decision, battle. but I'm not, but I'm not equating. And again, I'm not arguing with you. I'm saying 
I personally don't care what me or fans or whoever think on Twitter as far as what's the right move. I, I get, you're a hundred percent right. If he takes out X, Y, Z player and they lose anyways, it's because he took out X, Y, Z player that, that I get. And you're again, a hundred percent right about that. I guess, again, my only question was not how are the He's fans going to react. He's coaching to avoid what people react. Right, right. Nor, and that, uh, nor should he. He left that line that he did what he wanted. He did what he feels is the right thing to do. So he trusted the team to execute. The team didn't execute. And, and I'll go to Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson was famous for this. Phil Jackson wouldn't call timeouts. Yeah. Phil Jackson would let these guys try to figure. So when he says in the post game, uh, this, this is a learning lesson. Then you know we have no way of getting in his head, but you you you're I'm trying to extrapolate from what you're saying. Maybe that's kind of what he was partially referring to. I think it's a learning lesson on a lot of levels, but I'm sure that that has a little bit to do with it. Yes. By the way, is there yeah. is that repetitive? A learning lesson? Like, is there a lesson that's not learning? I'm just asking. <laughs> Jason, I don't know. Okay, back to you. Um, so, Katie, I guess uh, the, the pushing this forward then to Indiana. I mean, you you couldn't have two more difficult losses. I, I liked the response yesterday, uh, the way the Kings played for about 40, 42 minutes or so, uh, yeah. which was encouraging. But then you know you get a second heaping of of painful losses. Um, how do you think they, you know, handle that going into uh, just uh, two more games here at home with Indiana tomorrow? Oh man, I mean, it's it's. Uh, if I'm being honest, it's scary to me, right? Um, because you've had two difficult losses on the road, two that we can honestly say you should have won. You should have come out of that road trip four and one. You should have. And losing those two games was completely within your power, right? Um, and then you come home, first game of a road trip, you've been gone for nine days. Listen, there is legit, like, a thing about the first game home from a road trip being difficult. And I, I think a lot of it to me is the travel, the jet lag. The time. We've been in every single time zone. They're going to get up this morning. They're probably already, like, heading to the gym to start the day and it's like what how, how many hours of sleep have you had what time zone are you in like there is like a there's a lethargy that comes with coming back from a road trip in that game one it's a game against indiana tyrese halliburton is not playing so how just crazy is it when the best player for a team isn't playing what, what do those games generally feel like to you uh, that we're gonna lose Trap games. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's the first game back yeah. from a road trip where inevitably, Katie, I'm counting. I'm putting the over under on four and a half. The times that you or your partner says, "Oh, off the front rim, those legs look tired." Um, That's inevitable uh, for any time back from a road trip. It's the legs are tired. <laughs> and we're missing everything front rim. Yeah, yeah. It's again. It's there's. There, I'm sure there's science behind it. I understand, but you know what? Here's the reality. Um, it's an 82 game season and every single team in the association has to deal with the That's same right. stuff, which includes the first games back from long road trips. That's right. Teams have two games at home before they go out for seven mm. more games. Are you excited? So it's like, Oh, I'm freaking thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cannot wait. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope, uh, it was I hope great chatting with you guys. Sorry. I took up two of your segments. No, you asked all the questions. Honestly, we figured you'd be chatty this morning. So we penciled that in, uh, for it two was a good discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I would be, chat I haven't even had my coffee yet. So oh, you I'm yelled at me yesterday when you didn't have your coffee. You. <laughs> Straight up. She yelled. She oh. like text yelled at me. Oh. So I haven't had my coffee yet. Jesus. Were there caps? Uh, yes. Yes. There was an all I caps. I think Were there other words that you can't say yes no no i think i said i think i said good lord and jesus <laughs> it was an all caps jesus uh katie you'll be happy to know that tuesday february 13th is the next tuesday game hey katie it's <laughs> hey hey katie it's at, it's at phoenix Oh. I know, I know it is. I know we don't have a game the day before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, looking forward to that. 
Uh, she is the uh, pride of likely California, Alturas County, and uh, so much more. Alturas County. You get some things right, and then you just completely... What I get wrong? It's, it's Modoc County. Alturas is a town there, but those people that are maybe hunters know what you're talking about. I she, guess. she is a hick from places we've never heard of. It's the... <laughs> It's the first it first congressional district, District 1 in California. I do know that. Katie Christensen, yeah. the uh, analyst. All right. Here, King. Thank you, and thank uh, you. have fun adulting. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, boy, boy. <laughs> it's Katie Christensen joining us. We'll take a break. Uh, when we come back, Jason, uh, who needs this Super Bowl more? I think 